Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul Callum Carrion, and we have a special guest today. We'll talk to Gellert Hart from the Ambeth Winery, but in the meantime, I want to do a little business here. This uh, podcast is sponsored by the Original Wine of the Month Club, where we've been doing business for 48 years. We appreciate that sponsorship, and this podcast is available on Spotify, Google Play, uh, iTunes, and all the rest of your favorite hangout places, but this is a great, extraordinary opportunity, not only because uh, we have the first biodynamic organic farmer in Paso Robles, but um, I've had more than a few people tell me in the last few days, have you talked to Ambeth yet? <laughs> Which I had not heard of, and then Kevin came in with your catalog. I'm like, wow, this stuff's pretty and cool. So tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, Gellert. Yeah. Gellert. Where's, is that Welsh, too? That's a Welsh name, yeah. And yeah. Ambeth uh, is Welsh, you said. Yeah, Ambeth is... Two separate words combined, so it looks pretty on the label. And yeah, right. uh, means forever in Welsh. We have so much to talk about because I'm looking at the color of these wines, and I want to talk to you about the orange wines, and I want to talk to you about the biodynamic. But I, I wanted to start with just the fact that we have a little bit of synergy in our backgrounds because your father was in the carpet business. Yeah. So <laughs> similar. <laughs> where was this, and what was he doing? Um, he moved to the states 40 years ago from from England um, after jumping around Australia and South Africa for a bit, uh, getting into the flooring and oriental rug business in South Africa and saw um, that there was a need for it here in California. So he started that up in Newport Beach, um, right place, right time. Yeah. Um, Newport Coast was just starting to get built up and found. So, um, yeah, he started Isn't that amazing started that something like the place like Newport Coast really didn't happen until the 70s and oh, 80s. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> it was empty hills, yeah, yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Phenomenal <laughs> real estate for like that. No, it's 2 million. Yeah, exactly. Lots. I grew up in the Palos Verdes, uh, and my parents' house was literally on the cliff, and when they bought it, it was a, a garbanzo field. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, how could this be a garbanzo field? <laughs> and this is like prime real estate in California, mm -hmm. but it's pretty amazing. So he was, he decided to get into business. It sounds like he was well-traveled. Did he, does he... Was it just bouncing around trying to find something to do? Or do you like South Africa? What? Um, and yeah, just, just kind of getting around, bouncing around, doing what restaurant jobs. Um, you know, um, exploring the world and and finding quality food and, and that's just amazing. Delving deeper into the wine world and uh, you know, plenty of trips to Italy and France. And, do you speak uh, multi languages or just English or? Uh, Kind of dabbles you could in get, a few. get by. Yeah. <laughs> dabbles, yeah. That's impressive, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the risk factor, like, you know, no fear. Just go out and just make yeah. things happen. Yeah, so he, he definitely led the way. Um. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that and that would lead into, you know, getting into the wine business, which is not the easiest business in the world. So uh, he decided that he was going to make wines, or he was, what, how did that come about? Um. So, yeah, in, in Orange County, getting that started, um, because – running the, the flooring business. Uh, he had some friends that were deeply in the industry, um, actually in Paso Robles, and uh, did, did some business down in Orange County. And so he would, he would talk to them a lot, and, and he just really wanted to get into the winemaking side of things. Um, so this is, this is back in the early 90s. And he would get grapes from his friends up in Paso, drive them down in the back of his car, and... Um, Make wine in his garage. Wow, <laughs> Costa Mesa. This is the nineties now. Mm -hmm. um, Cause we started in this nineteen seventy two this business, but my dad's store was one of the preeminent stores in the L.A. County for probably through the seventies and the early eighties. Bought it as a liquor store, so it's kind of when wine was sort of getting started. But the biodynamic movement, the organic movement, is a little later, right? When did when did he get a hold of this idea? Yeah, he. Um, uh, basically, he, he wanted to do organic farming. He's always been into organics before organics was even a word or a thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, he grew up on a farm in Wales, and he knew where his food came from and always kind of respected um, farmers and, and um, quality food. So he knew from the get-go he wanted to do organic farming um, with the wine, not necessarily make organic no-sulfite wine, um, but he knew he wanted to do something a little better than what other others were doing at that time. So um, in 03, we planted the vines at Ambeth Estate in Templeton, which is just 15 minutes north or south of Paso. And um, he, uh, before that, he did a trip to uh, Italy and met a winemaker out there that was farming biodynamically and just 
kind of fell in love with the whole idea of, of um, doing that that way and working with the cosmos and getting a little more involved with the uh, with the um, the growth and the, you know just the the at the nature side of things rather than looking at it scientifically so um, he kind of dove into biodynamics and said it's we're just going to do a biodynamics huge. from the get-go it was a perfect property that he found it was just cattle land um, just uh, wild grasses and yeah perfect. so when it happens uh, I know if you try to convert a conventional farm <coughs> of anything whether it's wheat or grapes or or corn that it takes a certain amount of time for the uh, certification to come around because you've got to sort of clear the land of its toxins and whatever else is happening now. right when you buy fresh land is there a separate process or that you can start right away or what how do they do that yeah if you if you have vines that are conventionally farmed it takes three years for the for the process to actually go through to get certified biodynamically yep. um w yeah my my dad was um lucky enough to find this open plot southeast facing <laughs> right in the middle of the templeton wine gap um this was back when vines weren't surrounding us all yes. over the place right. it was just open grassland you know north facing oaks um so it was it just seemed like the perfect spot um and he just said i'm gonna so I, this is i'm gonna start peeling it back a little bit because i did buy property thinking i was gonna retire in paso yeah we were on the hot side on by martin what was called martingale circle over by australia river road behind uh Zaka mesa and we decided that we'd end up at the beach, so <laughs> we, we yeah. didn't end up there. But um, it does get hot. Definitely. It was expensive. You know, the <laughs> land was not too expensive, but the planting of the grapes. Now, when you buy, when you're getting ready to put shoots in the ground for biodynamic farming, are they different than the source of conventional grapes? It's the same root stock. You just treat it differently. No, you could do the same root stock. Um, my dad actually went uh, a step further, and eighty percent of our our vines are self rooted. Really? Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah, so, and um, you can see how strong those guys are compared to the 20% that are grafted. Um, during the drought, especially, those grafted ones struggled. Um, the own rooted ones, you know, stayed strong. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't produce much fruit, sense. but they definitely were stronger. It showed. Yeah, I, this conversation goes so many directions. I'm so fascinated by it, and I, and, uh, I was only ex not only exposed, but I've been exposed to a lot of biodynamic wines through tasting every Tuesday, but uh, every story seems to be a little bit different. I just had a winemaker in here from Sardinia who makes Sangiovese biodynamically in, in Sardinia, but he also adds music to this mm -hmm. vineyard, so he's got Bach playing throughout, <laughs> I swear. Yeah. Bose speakers. He goes, I have a Bose speaker system all the way out thing, and he says, <laughs> we did experiments where, the, where they put... To, uh, to the same vine in two different rooms or two different parts of the vineyard played rock music one way and classical music in the other way and the he said the vines grew toward the classical music and away from the rock music okay uh, that one's a hard, little cool. harder to swallow yeah. right yeah, yeah. but yesterday i was having a conversation with peter koff who's one of the master of wines one of the few master of wines in the world and he he and i agreed completely that the the liveliness of a biodynamic wine is obvious and it's obvious from it's you know the way it's uh, farmed in the way it's processed. I mean, it's clear. And I tell people they're not necessarily better or, different or, or worse. They're just different, and they have, but they have a certain livelihood to them. So tell me, in a, in a nutshell, kind of what the biodynamic concept is, because I know it includes the cycles of the moon and the gravitational pull of the moon and why that happens. Just sort of a recap for the public to understand what, what the difference between organic and, our, and biodynamic is. Yeah, um, basically it's a way of, uh, in one sentence, it's a holistic approach to farming um, that uses the influence of the cosmos as well. So it's, uh, it's a step beyond organics and the fact that you're not bringing anything off the property. Everything's on the property, so um, animal husbandry is super important, um, having animals on the property for fertilizing, for um, mowing, <laughs> for for everything, for the, the, the life forces and the nature's forces of the property just being alive rather mm -hmm. than just um, some static environment. So um, biodynamics is, is basically just, um, um, yeah, sorry, I was going away. No, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I was, well, well, there's a gentleman named Piero Incinza. He makes biodynamic Pinot Noir in Argentina. His pedigree background in winemaking from his grandfather in Italy. And he, 
one of the great explanations I've ever heard. He says, you know, if the earth, if the moon can move the seven tenths of the earth through tides, you know, right? I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the most form. obvious thing that you can see on, right. on the planet. Right. And, yeah. and we are mostly water, our bodies anyway, mm -hmm. and the structure of soil, which I, which uh, I didn't bring the book up. I want to show you a book I've been reading, which is about vineyard rocks, mm -hmm. you know, and the different styles of rocks and what they do. But that is a pretty profound statement that if, that if we're using the gravitational pull of the earth, I mean the moon to, to nutri to give nutrients to the roots to you know have, I think that's valid. It, it, on the big, on the surface, it sounds sort of hocus pocus, but when you hear it in that context, that the that that if the moon can earth move that much water, that man would never be able to do on their own. Mm -hmm. Imagine what it does to nature and our bodies. Yeah, and then you think about the whole solar system and what does Mars, you know, how, how does yeah. that influence us in certain ways? You know, maybe um, food tastes better on, on days where Venus is behind I, a certain, I, <laughs> you I, know? I, I, I think there's, there's validity so to So many things that you can think about. That it seems to me, and I've challenged a couple of people on this concept because uh, I suspect that if I went to the farmer's market and picked up tomatoes and and swiss chard and whatever else i was cooking that day and they were biodynamically farmed with fruits and vegetables and i went to the ralph's conventional section and bought the same exact things and made the same exact dish with the same temperatures everything prepared the same way that the biodynamically farmed fruits and vegetables would taste better hands down right no oh, yeah. question right <laughs> and then i asked the question and maybe you have the answer to this and don't you ever wonder why the big truck coming down the five freeway with full of tomatoes and the ones at the bottom aren't tomato sauce yet because they've been modified <laughs> to 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 to, uh, to do withstand that pressure you right know, they're genetically modified yeah and they don't go off for weeks and yeah. it's like something's I, wrong here i grow a tomato in my garden and it's you know it's good for about a week two right. weeks yeah know? yeah it doesn't make <laughs> sense a month later uh that tomato's still yeah alive yeah, so, and well and hard it's weird <laughs> uh dan Berger of uh blue hill farms in new york he wrote a book called the third plate it's a very interesting book you should get it if you since you do this for a living uh, but he talks about uh, throughout the world not only uh, crops in in wheat crops in america but iberian pigs and what they eat and farm fish uh, fish that are farmed versus natural it's a very interesting book about this concept but he also says you can't you can't feed the world organically even biodynamically because the organic doesn't produce enough so mm -hmm. what's the yields on these kinds of plants that you well so that takes in another fact that we're dry farmed yeah. and that that's that's what affects the yields more than the biodynamic side oh of i see okay <laughs> that makes sense right so you no yeah. water no irrigation strictly what nature gives you when it gives it to you 14 inches of rain average a year where we are um the Templeton's on the cool side of Faso, right? It's on the one-on-one -on -one side, basically? Yeah, we're in what's called the Templeton Gap. Mm -hmm. So um, we're usually five, eight degrees cooler than uh, Paso proper. Um, we do have that maritime influence and that, those winds that come through. We do get fogs in the morning and in the summer, and that gives a little bit of a thirst quench for the vines. You mm -hmm. can see them perk up almost yeah. every morning, and then every afternoon it's like, oh, too hot. <laughs> and they're kind of they're kind of <laughs> struggling, but... um. It's that struggle is what, what makes really interesting fruit. Um, you know, um, it makes a concentrated juice. We, we purchased fruit in the past um, to make up for our lack of fruit, especially during the drought years. And um, foot stomping everything that we do, you really get a, a, an understanding of, of what kind of juice is coming out of those grapes. So we get irrigated biodynamic fruit, very good fruit, um, farmed properly, but irrigated. And you foot stomp those things and it's really thin skins and it's like mushy jello almost, you know, and it's like really liquidy, wow. um, kind of translucent, you know, like yeah, not much sure. to it. And then you foot stomp our dry farm grapes, which are hard, yeah. <laughs> you know, thick skin, tough. And, um, the, you know, the, the juice that comes out of the red grapes is like blood, you know, it's like stains your feet That's instantly. Amazing. So it's right there. That's you can see there's a huge difference. Absolutely fascinating. Well, mm. besides the fact, uh, you know, irrigated farms, the roots aren't going to go deep because they can find their water on the surface. Mm -hmm. And now maybe we're not getting such terroir out of the grapes because exactly. we're not going yeah. down to find it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I find, uh, you know, a lot of conversations I've had about this with burgundy makers, particularly because they're with their weather problems, they kind of, and they have to be dry farmed as well. They have, you know, they've got to really learn and understand how these grapes are going to grow 
and produce grapes that will produce some wines that you want to drink, right? That's important. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the public's reactions to this brand. Now, what was your first actual vintage <laughs> in the bottle? Um, 06 was our first year. Um, we didn't get much off that year, so 08 is our kind of our, our official. And the first plantings, or I forgot? 03. 03. So yeah. isn't it Paso, wasn't like 04, like this huge glut of grapes? Like, like the guy behind me didn't even pick. He didn't have any contracts, and he just let them dry. It was, a, I think, oh, I think it was oh four. There was just this plethora of grapes out there. But you, yeah, but it. yeah, we chose a good year. My dad chose a good year to yeah, plant so. because uh, <laughs> we we planted in the fall. They got five gallon drip buckets each, uh, one bucket each, and that's that's all the water they got. Thank God the wow that winter was really good. Um, and uh, that's amazing. Had a had a lot of rainfall and everything got pretty established quickly. so now the grapes are like fighting they got to go deep but how deep are these roots do you think these tap roots um it's hard to know we we, kind of we planted right? one vine a little bit too close to the road <laughs> <laughs> so we we wanted to pull it out a year later and um it actually tore the bumper off um our, our quad that we were just trying to rip it out what yeah so it's, that's amazing. I mean, it's the tap roots must go forever. Yeah. And, and now that vine, we can't kill it. Yeah. <laughs> like we've chopped it down to the ground. We've we've tried everything, and it's like it still comes back. So it's okay. It can that's stay. phenomenal. It can stay. <laughs> so at the at the Templeton Gap, then what what would be down there? You said it was calcareous. Is calcareous it's... clays, sandy clay loam. Yeah. Um, ton of limestone. And these, this is what you're going to taste in these wines when we taste them, I suppose. Yeah, minerality, um, acid is is pretty pronounced through all of them. Um, so the marketing of, of, you know, I, and I, I'm so happy you're here because we just are launching tomorrow a club based on biodynamic and organic farming. Uh, and there's there's enough out there. Now, a lot of these, a lot of them aren't even labeled that way. For instance, uh, Bodega Chakra in Argentina, he doesn't even put any of this stuff on the labels. Um, and he's the gentleman I was talking about. And when you, when you said about this, the, the holistic approach, one of the comments he made was, the armadillos have come back, and the ants are back, and the, the snakes are back, and the, 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 the uh, uh, animal kingdom is, has now yeah. returned to this vineyard that was that didn't happen for a long time. But mm. you have a lot of oh yeah our, critters our, around there <laughs> our vineyard is alive there's praying mantises ladybugs spiders galore uh -huh. um <laughs> so you look at the the vineyards next door and they're so pristine it's there's something wrong with it you know yeah, like right. there's no there's no weeds right, growing right? there's no grasses growing it's like you know all the all the all the insects and things need, need those sure um to survive so and then you have cycle. water dripping there and that that attracts you know the wrong kind of bugs so it's it kind of the whole ecology of the thing is, is just demented when when humans get too um, manipulative you know yeah. with that so dan talks about that in his yeah. book he says you know we screwed up the farms of america you know yeah and he and he talks about it maybe you guys have the same experience he talks about how we can go into the vineyard and, or into the wheat farm and look at the weeds and say okay well if this weed's growing, we're short here. We need to replant, and so they do a lot of uh, cross planting. That they'll put snap peas, or they'll put you know whatever other. Uh, if they, if the soil needs nitrogen, then they'll plant a uh, some a cover crops. Crop, some, yeah, yeah, cover crop that has that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I think that's amazing to me because, and I see now you have orange wines. And t tell me, uh, my daughter, who's a millennial, and I think this <laughs> it, it leans that direction. I mean, it's a joke, but. Um, she took me to a Brooklyn uh, natural, quote unquote, as we know, there's no definition for that, wine store in Brooklyn. I'm sure she's going to take me when we go this weekend again. And I grabbed a bottle of uh, Sicilian Nero de Avila. It was on the bottom shelf. I had no idea what I was getting. She just said, it's natural, Dad, so I bought it. It was $75. <laughs> cool. You can imagine I'm in the business every day. I, $75 is a lot of money to spend on a bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't drink it. And she goes, but it's natural. I said, but... I don't care. I, well, you know, I want to be able to drink it, right? So, uh, but and I don't. I don't think anybody wants to give up the character of the wine and the palatability of the wine just because it's it's natural or biodynamic. So, but the orange wine concept is not new, really. It's new to the U.S., but it's not a new idea. Georgians have been doing it in, yeah. in, in mm -hmm. Soviet country forever. Italians have been doing it. What forever. is the concept behind yeah. an orange wine? Uh, it's basically a white grape made in the style of a red wine. So. That means skin contact or skin maceration. And um, so that's instead of just picking the grape, 
and pressing it off right away, which you would do for a, a typical white wine. Um, you actually press it and put it back on the skins. In our case, we foot stomp and leave it on the skins. Um, anywhere from a day to two weeks to um, 10 months, we've done um, skin maceration. So what that, what that does is it leaches all the tannins from the skins mm -hmm. and the color. So you're basically getting a full bodied tannic white wine. And so the structurally, the balance wise, you know, why didn't we do this in the beginning? Why are we, why did we think I don't know. It's our, it's our favorite thing now. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, we're, we'll why leave. do we siphon off the top and leave the skin contact <laughs> out? Why, why does that happen? I see these yeah. are unfiltered, done fine. Is, mm -hmm. is that, is that a biodynamic principle as well that, that you don't touch it after it's. No, you can actually filter and you with biodynamics, you can, you can do sulfites too. Yeah. Um, you, you can do a little manipulation in the winery. We, we choose to not do anything. Um, and the shelf life of a wine without any added sulfites? Um, all our current releases are 2013. It's 2019 yeah, so right it's now. So um, we, we purposely wait until we feel like it's ready to release. Yeah. Um, a lot of them take five to eight years to really turn around and really, wow. taste amazing. So uh, the whites and the oranges seem to be, uh, they, they can release a little bit sooner. Um, they don't need that, that time aging, but again orange wines you can age it like a red wine you can put that in your cellar for probably 20 years it would probably taste amazing you know this uh, whole th it's just i get a billion questions right because it's just yeah. a fascinating yeah, subject yeah. and it, you know one of the things that we always hear from people oh, i get headaches when i drink red wine and you know, they blame <laughs> it on the sulfites which you know probably most likely it's the histamines in the red skins but uh, does that exist now when you make orange wine we have extended skin contact are we getting more histamines or is it not doesn't even exist in the in the, in the white skins I'm not sure. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't get headaches yeah, <laughs> from it. Well, if I, I drink a sulfite of wine, I get headaches. There's and, a couple of companies that do what I do that only specialize in this. One of the reasons I started this club, and they, they tell you it's healthier, which I agree. But they also talk about how you don't have a hangover, which I'm not sure I agree with that because it's, it's still alcohol. <laughs> <I think it's laughs> you drink enough. You're exactly. <laughs> So have you found that in these varietals, and I can't tell from here, uh, I see one of them was an interesting, uh, this, the red here. Mm. Um, varietally, are you finding different reception to the biodynamic principles? Like I know Pinot is extraordinarily sensitive to its environment and will change radically you know, from one vineyard to the other, but how about some of these other varietals? Are you finding them receptive to biodynamic farming and in, in some more than others? Um. Yeah, it's hard to pinpoint, especially dry farming. If, if we did irrigate, we would probably be able to see those a little bit clearer. But um, uh, we have 13 different varieties on the property. Some don't do as well as others, for sure. Um, but we, but um, compared to other wineries that grow the same varieties, it seems like they have the same issues, even though they're irrigated. So for no, sure. I don't see any, any negative effect with biodynamics. We had a we one of the one of the best uh, seminars I've ever been to, and you can imagine for thirty years I've been to a lot of them. But uh, finally, somebody brought me a cross section of Burgundy in the in the famous Appalachians, you know, Jevy Champertin and those places. And they had taken the cross section and what the volcan volcanoes and the plate changes had done to it. So, in explaining why across the street from one vineyard, you can have a completely different tap. The tap roots can go to a different place mm -hmm. as far as even though they went 30 feet they're in a different type of soil than across the street and why these little appellations exist Paso doesn't seem like this probably like that though probably where my vineyard was which was on the other side of 46 versus the temple the gap is probably different but amongst your acreage do you see a difference in how a grape might receive uh, where it's growing is it pretty much the same um, yeah, I mean, we're 42 acres. Uh, the That's top of our size. hill is 1,700 feet, and the bottom of it is 800 feet. So, oh, so there's microclimates all big, over our right. little 42 acres. It's, wow. it's pretty amazing. We have Merved planted in uh, three different vineyards, and we have done batches where we, we, we get that Mervedra and we we keep it totally separate 100 percent and they taste completely different. Yeah, Even incredible. though you'd think the soil structure is the same, it's uh, you know a little southeast facing, one's kind of west facing, yeah. Um, and yeah, that it's that's so cool. Yeah, totally different. So that leads into this this passion of the of the vine, right? In uh, 
probably the people that listen to this podcast um, are getting tired of hearing this, but it's so important. And the passion of making wine is really about the passion of making wine. And clearly your family has that passion. And what you're trying to do is produce wines that are expressive of where they're at and more than that, right? Mm. Uh, expressive of everything that ha happens around the vineyard. And you don't drink wine. Uh, uh, you drink beer because it tastes like beer, right? You, you drink Heineken because you like Heineken. You drink Jim Beam because you like Jim Beam. And it, it's the distilling master's job to make sure it tastes the same, and it's the brewmaster's mm -hmm. job to make sure it tastes the same. Mm -hmm. But you, you, no way you can do that, particularly in the biodynamic no. world. Now, when I stocked the shelves of my dad's store with Gallo Rhine wine, you know, that's who knows what was in that. Now it's kind of scary to find out. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but you're you're given something every not now not every year not only but just different parts of the vineyard you're giving something else from the nature to make these wines from. So your job is kind of to get out of the way, right? Yeah, pretty much let it let it take its course. And uh, I mean, picking the grape is probably the the biggest situation you know um, decision that we make. Um, hand vintage to vintage, yeah, everything's hand harvested. Um, and so, yeah, uh, they differ vintage to vintage. Yeah, um, sometimes, time. yeah, sometimes drastically. So, how does the public? This is the part that's interesting to me because I, this, I have wonderful friends that have beautiful cellars and they put Napa Cab in there and you know whatever, hmm. and it, it's pretty much this is what I like, right? And it's not frustrating necessarily, but I want to expose them to concepts like this where. Yeah, you might get a Moved from Ambeth in 2015, and it may not be the same in 2016. It probably, probably won't be. Right. Yeah. But but you're not drinking it because of that. You're drinking because of what it is. You know. Yeah, and it's fun, and it's, and it's it's yeah, it's fresh. Right. Um, you know, it, it's I don't know, <laughs> just drinking the same thing all the time. It's right. like it's, we got beer for that. You know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> wine is supposed to be like fun, and you're supposed to have it with food, and you know. Uh, every everything should be different about it because there's no sulfites in these wines when you open it it will change day to day yes, so right. um, the third day open they're actually at their best most of these wines um, so it's fun to just you know drink some put the cork back on you know revisit it the next day and yeah. it's good right now let's drink it right, right. <laughs> well i always tell people it's kind of like putting this uh, paintings in your house and the same artist all over because eventually you're going to see the pattern <laughs> of the painters thought process and it's not going to be interesting anymore and for me when i get home um I, you know i look at the label and i actually look not the label but i look at what it is and my wife says oh, i'd like a glass of wine and and i i know what kind of mood she's in i know what stuff she likes i know what stuff she doesn't like i know when she's prepared to experiment when she's not but uh i think about the mood uh, when we're what you would think about food or you think about yeah. with friends you're with you you have to make a conscious decision what am i going to open to maximize this experience with who i'm with because wine should be an experience yeah it should be a thought-provoking exactly. connection to the to the earth and that's my philosophy after all these years and it's taken a long time to come to that conclusion you know i've, I've sold a lot of wine and we send millions of bottles out a year and it's like but now i realize this process that you're going through is connecting people literally their souls and their body to the earth in the cosmos in your in in your case yeah and i had a young lady from armenia in here and she was very passionate about what she makes and she's she's owns a winery in argentina as well and one of the comments she made i thought was very interesting to me she goes what other product can you produce from the earth and the soul the soil and take it with you and take that that feeling across the world. Mm. Like you can take these wines now to Italy or France or wherever you want to go and say, this is what we do here and this is how it's different. Yeah. You can taste Captures the difference. Captures the time too and the vintage yeah. and the terroir and it's it's really cool. That's, it's what, that's what's cool about the different vintages tasting different yeah. every year. It's, uh, yeah. So how's the, pro how is the brand, now? let's talk business a little bit. How's the brand, uh, it's been a few years now, um, is it outside of the geographic areas of Paso? Is it into the larger markets like LA? Where, what, how's that being received? Yeah, um, California is a great market for us. Um, we, we've been growing with the whole natural wine movement. Um, you know, from from day one, 
Um, we've just been seeing more and more um, locals <laughs> stopping yeah, by right. our winery, which is great. But um, uh, Northern Europe really enjoys our stuff. Um, they, really? they like the old world profile, but wow. not so much, you know, the, um, you know, the known names, which is like pretty cool to get, you know, our, our European so-called old world yeah. in new world wines over back to the old world. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> it is true. And it's really appreciated over there, which is great. Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Um, we're in Japan now. Um, that's Demographically, a- you see a difference. You're in Japan. That's Japan being a more educated palate than the Chinese palate mm-hmm. so far anyway, because they've been enjoying wine longer. But um, is there a demographic program that I mean that difference that you're seeing uh, my demographic here is 25 to 54 um, I for sure just based on my daughter who's 25 26 in New York that they lean towards these concepts are you seeing that too or is it yeah I, I think there's a, just a, definitely a, a younger crowd um, I think it's just more of the open mind you know I'm yeah. not just going to drink what my parents have been drinking yeah. forever <laughs> especially knowing now what's in it um, but yeah, definitely a younger crowd. I would say our demographic is yeah, 30 to 30 to 40. I would love to see uh, the, the conversations. I, I put on a wine dinner recently with some college friends of mine. We had about 50 guys there. And, and you know, th- these guys come up and go, oh, yeah, I got, you know, my cellar. I've got Camus and I've got, you know, <laughs> classified growth Bordeaux. And I'd love to have them come over and say, yeah, I just got this new biodynamic and uh, it's grown in this type of soil or it's grown in this kind of shale or uh, it's you know, dry farm, whatever those concepts are that, and have them start talking about those concepts. Yeah, not just the name. Yeah. Not just <laughs> or the, the region where it's from. Yeah, it doesn't, it I mean, big deal, right? <laughs> right? It's like, what, is it, what does it make you feel in a moat than it does you know, what it, that you're able to buy? Mm. It's kind of like owning a supercar. It's like, well, the other day, I was at my gym, okay? <laughs> I couldn't believe this. <laughs> and there's this, McLaren, you know, like, what is that? $300,000 supercar, Michael, something like that. And uh, it's in the parking lot of this little local gym. And so this little young kid leaves. They asked the man, owner of the gym. I said, where's that? Is that his car? Is that his McLaren? He goes, yeah, his dad bought it for him because he, gra- he got into UCLA. I'm like, oh, he's going to drive that car around Westwood <laughs> <laughs> just because, why? Just because his dad could afford it, which is great. And so you drink do I just drink classified Bordeaux just because I can afford it? That's not a really mm. good reason. Mm. So I can tell my friends I drank it. I would like to drink something like this where I can say, do you taste this? Do you feel this? Do you understand what the, the soil that you're, the, you know, the roots that you're tasting? This is, that's the part that's been fascinating me recently. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I'd love to have you come back one of these days. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we'll do it again after a couple of vintages and see uh, see what you're doing next because it sounds like you're ready to just try and try and try and see what comes out. Yeah, yeah, we experiment a lot. We're, we're getting into the cider um, quite a bit. We've been doing great um, skin contact ciders. Really? And uh, <laughs> uh, quince ciders have been aging in uh, terracotta amphoras. Um, we've been doing... Yeah, good question before we get off this. Yeah. Uh, these amphora wines too or no? Uh, most of them are, yeah. We have we have sixteen amphoras in the winery now. Um, uh, terracotta amphoras from Italy. We have uh, California clay amphoras made in in Oregon. We have Australian vitrified clay eggs. Um, so yeah, it's just different amphoras and different different aging vessels. Well, I guess I'm not done with this conversation. Yet. I <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> opened up a whole <laughs> new <laughs> thing because um, when we were in Beaujolais, we saw concrete eggs. Uh, and the amphora conversations popped up a lot lately, and so I'm wondering, um, that industry must have been almost dead, you know, 20 years ago, mm-hmm. to buy find amphoras to make wine in because who was doing that? Right. But now it sounds like this is all kinds of sources. Yeah, stainless was the big thing, and and um, yeah, the amphoras we find is just great because it's it's a way to age the wines where they can get contact with the air but still be in a neutral environment yeah. so it's again you're, you're tasting the grape and a living grape that can breathe um, so you get something that's um, I, I like to call them rustic wines uh, kind of old world um, palate um, their happy oxidation is another <laughs> yeah. different, from, different from concrete yeah very different from concrete um, 
concrete doesn't breathe as much as as these amphoras you can actually see wine seep through some of the older amphoras that we wow. have so the, the pores are are rather big P uh, piero in, in cisa was talking about a concrete uh, vat that he designed which is a shallow uh larger surface area vat for his pinos but and i'll close with this when we were in armenia in 2006 and that was before they got technology and they have dozens and dozens of indigenous wine grapes and you know like the georgians do and uh, the wines that are coming from armenia now are pretty good they're doing a good job they're starting to plant some french varietals but that day that we were there we stopped at a winery and the guy had a concrete vat it was an open vat but it looked like he had fixed the cracks with like henry's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> henry's roof repair and i'm like oh my god this is, this is yeah terrible <laughs> which they were anyway <laughs> Geller, it's been a, a great pleasure having you here, and I hope uh, we get to see you again. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. I'd love to have your father down, too, if he's uh, definitely likes yeah. to do this kind of thing, and we can yeah, for take sure. this to the next level. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Cheers.